Hello, project people. You are listening to the Project Chatter podcast. I'm Val Matthews, and we made it. We are back, and it's 2021. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Dale Fung. Hey, folks. Hey, Val. Yeah, a happy new year to everyone. I'm really excited uh, to kick off this new season uh, with a fantastic pod today, which I'm sure is going to get all of your juices flowing. I hope so, mate. I hope so. Project Controls <laughs> is our bread and butter. Um, also, just a reminder to those listeners to hit the subscribe button on whichever platform you listen to your good podcasts or YouTube channel for bonus bits. Uh, on this episode, we are joined by Niall Farris, Simon Taylor, and Hezron Ricketts. Hi, Niall, Simon, Hezron. Great to have you on the pod. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having Hello. me. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Yeah. yeah happy New Year. <laughs> happy New Year, guys. Well, I, I'm going to get into it, but before I do, um, here's Dale with your bios. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, cheers, ah. cheers, Val. Um, some really amazing bios and lots of experience between the three of them. I'll start with Hezron. So Hezron is a project control specialist with 17 years of experience in delivering planning and project controls on major programs such as London 2012 Olympics, High Speed 2, Ministry of Defense, Thames Tideway, Super Sewer, and many more. Having worked for client, contractors, and consultants, he has a broad understanding of the intricacies of the challenges faced by these during delivery. He puts a strong emphasis in effective behaviors and collaboration in tandem with best practice technical skills to provide project controls. Added to this, he has sought to innovate with the adoption of cutting edge technology and to push his profession to carry pace with other fast moving industries. He is an advocate of equality and providing opportunities for all to flourish despite their circumstances. I love that last bit, Hezron. Yeah, so on to Simon. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that your sales bit there at the end? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just like the world needs to be a fairer place for everyone. Like, so no, that. absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, on to Simon's one. So Simon's career in construction started in the early 2000s when he took a job as a project manager working within the London underground supply chain. Rising through the ranks, he soon took on planning, planning manager, and head of planning positions, delivering some of LU's most complex programs, notably the Victoria Line upgrade. He was also heavily involved in planning and controls career development, including direct responsibility for the Transport for London planning apprenticeship. Simon joined the £56 billion High Speed 2 program in 2015 as head of program planning, where he was responsible for planning and planning capability on the largest infrastructure program in Europe. He is now co founder of Third Curve Limited, ex board member for the Association for Project Management, an active member of APM Planning, Monitoring and Control SIG, and co author of the APM Guide on Planning, Monitoring and Control. Wow, amazing. I don't know if we can top it off with yours, Niall, but you're up next. Well, no, no, yeah, well. <laughs> Niall is the CEO and co-founder of Third Curve. Having worked in multiple industries, Niall has had a number of leadership roles in complex programs, including Tideway, TFL PMO, New York MTA, and Crossrail. Niall is passionate about the role and value that program controls can deliver to an organization and is always seeking to adopt cutting edge technology and to push his profession to carry pace with other fast moving industries. He's an advocate of equality and providing opportunities for all to flourish. So very common themes there, gentlemen, and wow, um, amazing experience. And I'm really excited to um, get into your insight, um, but also to pick some of our experiences, because I think what a lot of the listeners do appreciate is uh, examples of where you know you particularly learn something um, along the way and obviously we'll we'll relate that back to the topic of uh, controls project controls evolution and how we attract talent and how that's evolved over the years and, and some of the changes um, but let, let's start with uh, controls evolution and and, and if, if we kind of go uh, look back first and, and and give a bit of a view of how it's evolved up to this current point in time and then maybe we'll take a stab at currently what's happening and then go into the bit of the future of what we can expect and how controls can evolve um let, let, let's start with simon simply because you're in the top left uh, of, of my my view simon just in your experience having worked across um, multiple areas um, and, and programs 
the evolution of controls, what's been significant for you uh, in your career? I think one of the key things is kind of controls was always there. You know, doing schedules was a project manager. You know, project PMs were doing plans. They were doing estimates. You know, they were kind of managing risks. It was always, and I think project controls as a thing, you know, as a as a profession, as as things got more difficult, it was like you know we need specific resources, people to specialize in these kind of areas. And I think maybe part of the maybe some of the negative sides of that is is as it's kind of specialized, it's maybe kind of a lack of overall understanding and appreciation of kind of what the point is. You know, so so I think whilst it's become kind of more focused in kind of how how it can deliver value and how it can you know add add value and add benefit, I think at the same time maybe some of the message has kind of been been diluted um, from like the you know what is a massively you know like think of the breadth of people that work on projects, right? You know, it's not just project project managers. Do you know what I mean? There's a massively diverse group of, of people. So I think that's you know it's come a long way to be to be specialised. Um, and I also I think it's still kind of rooted in a lot of the basics. And I think sometimes that's you know. Maybe that's not a good thing. I think a mm -hmm. lot of the world that we live in today is kind of very different from the, you know, back in the sort of 50s, 60s, you know, and on. I think, you know, like what we do now maybe doesn't necessarily suit some of the old ways. And so I feel that, um, you know, now with technology and coming to some of the stuff that us and, you know, and other other people in our, in our business, you know what I mean, and our clients are looking to innovate, innovate in this space. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of good opportunity, a lot of open ground now, do you know what I mean? A lot of good ideas, um, good mm -hmm. ideas coming in with that, you know, uh, input of, of, of new technology and, and tools. Absolutely. Um, no, that's very insightful. And, and Hezron, if we if move on to you, just on, I guess, a similar question, but do you think, um, with a slightly different view, do you think that um, the view of project controls has changed um, over the years in terms of what it potentially started out as and, and what it is today? Or is there still a, a big gap between what people think it is versus what it actually is or should be? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's still in in the state of evolution, uh, it's, and it's still evolving, really. To be perfectly honest with you, I think there are mixed views um, in the industry and outside of the industry. A lot of industries haven't heard uh, or don't use the terminology project controls necessarily, but most of the things they do are projects, which is a surprise still to me to this day. But I think one of the um, one of the early experiences I had in my career, an old project director I had, right, he handed me this book. On, on a project I was working for on the underground. Uh, and he had a book called the Nassau Project, right? And it's about the sort of um, US military and the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and stuff like that, and, and how they utilize project controls to build submarines and stuff like that. And that's sort of the early, early sort of outspring of, of project controls into the industry, right? So, uh, and where it's come to today, as Simon said, you know, the, the, I, I think it's good that the focus for the, the essentials, the fundamentals is still there because I think project controls isn't difficult. It shouldn't be. It's just a set of numbers really and, and tying things together and being binary around making decisions as opposed to just putting your finger in the air, right? So um, I think now that we, we try to take it a step forward, keeping the fundamentals the same by, um, by integrating uh, and by utilizing technology that we have at our disposal, that other industries, like, like you said in my bio, you know, I think other industries have taken a push on project controls and project management in general in the construction industry i think um what, what what we see a lot of companies trying to do and a lot of people trying to do innovators in the space is to try to bring the data sets together try to get the message as quickly as possible and accurately as possible to people to make the best decisions on any project that we're on right so i think it's it's going in the right direction but it needs a little bit more help no that's those are really great points and i think um you know both yourself and simon were speaking about you know, the, the, the triangle of people process technology around the control space. And we'll go into those little rabbit holes there. But before we do, Niall, if I come to you, just, just for everyone, what is project controls? Those that have never heard of project controls, what is project controls? On the, on the spot now, now. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I guess the interesting thing about that question is I, I could probably ask 10 people in the industry and get six answers. And uh, I think therein lies the challenge. So, um, and I think it's, it's very much up to, up to us and up to um, some of the champions of the industry to really distill on, on the message of, of project controls, the benefit of project controls, and also leverage the, the collaboration of all of the many, many, many projects going on around the world. Uh, I guess the, 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 bulk, the bulk answer is, you know, it's time, cost, quality, um, 
but we we like to build on that quickly you know i've i've operated in, in environments where you know the commercial is part of of project controls um i know simon simon worked on a on a project where he had um project communications sitting in project controls and um yeah i'm I, i'm really keen actually that the industry distills on that message and i think that will really help both clients understand but also you know potential talent understand you know what it is and and why they should um get involved in it yeah they're good they're good answers um i i, I hear what you're saying Niall, and i think you're right i think and and as well as ron and simon around you know it's project controls are still in a evolutionary state um and what's interesting is is you know project success rates if, if you believe any of the statistics aren't getting better and there's, there's a number of variables for that uh I, I could, it's not as black as white as everyone likes to think but obviously projects are getting more complicated as well and we do see that there is more generalization i.e the, the terminology at least of project controls is, is wider and more well known uh for example in australia we have project controls directors now if you ask mm. me what they do versus what what the role should entail they're a little bit different um but you'd see that in the absence of a PMO where traditionally you should have a PMO, but then in some places project controls would be part of PMO or maybe finance would be part of project controls or commercial, for example, would be part of project controls. So there is these, all these variances. Um, and I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges we have is, is how do we, how do we move forward mm. as a consensus, as a, as a profession? And usually, you know, with APM, Simon, you'd say that we have a charter project professional kind of some, type of standard that we can benchmark against um you, you'll find a lot of people aren't really required to certify as part of their progression in in the in the stream in, in project controls do you think what's your theory or what's your kind of silver bullet if there is one on the educational gap because there, there is a clear gap in skills competence and certifications uh out there Niall, what's what's your view on that um so my view on that is um, it's absolutely required. I, I've seen a number of really positive initiatives in this direction. Um, I, you know, we're working with Steve Wake and others around leveraging the, the relationship with with BSI. Um, we we also have seen like pockets of brilliance. Um, I know one of your your previous podcasts. You know, there's there was a, a podcast i believe from from ba systems or or yeah. that kind of area yeah, around Sam, simon white simon white yeah. yeah yeah fantastic session and um yeah. in terms of efforts to be made there where where i'd like to see it go is i'd like to see it go the same direction that the, the legal profession the accounting profession um the project management profession to a certain extent has gone i'd like to see it globally recognized um and i'd like to have that that thing to aim for rather than people just falling into it by chance and by luck um and it, we're, we're pretty passionate about getting involved in in those initiatives and i would say simon's simon's been the most proactive in that space and and has done a lot of work with both the apm and apprentice schemes yeah, I think one of the key, I suppose one of the problems, well, not problems, one of the huge challenges with this is, you know, we talked around like complexity of projects, right? And so if you think about, you know, I always think that managing interdependencies, right, is a critical part of, you know, of any kind of role in project managers, right? And, and as matter how good your brain is, sooner or later, you've kind of got to go, right, I've got to integrate information. People have got to work as a whole, as in a whole unit. And project controls naturally lends itself to doing that, right? So we think about, we integrate work breakdown structures, cost breakdown structures, estimate, risk breakdown structures. So the whole integrated data and tools is kind of really much one of the fundamentals of controls. But the problem is, is sometimes we, I think we find that the rigidity, right, can hinder you. So really kind of doing things by the book. If you're thinking about how do I codify a process to within an inch of its life, you'll find that very quickly it's not applicable. You know, there's so many diverse, such a diverse range of applications. So then you've kind of got to go, well, you kind of got to bring it up a level and you've got to go, well, let's just understand the principles and the outcomes. So then you go, well, how do you kind of train those principles and outcomes, right, in, in one way? And I think that this is maybe similar with project management. We all know that one of the things, you know, you get a big book and it's like how many years out of date and then you kind of got to refresh the book. And I think we've got to look at 
how do we kind of shorten those gaps, have a more iterative learning experience, but also with that, a more iterative view on how we evolve the way that we do project controls and project management and how do we adapt to the fact that this world is crazy, right? And changes all the time. So mm. it's almost like rather than let's all get, you know, a badge, right? And say, yeah, this is me. I've got this badge. It's how do we teach ourselves to adapt? Okay. And that's not just us as individuals, but the processes around us and the tools around us. So I definitely think that, you know, as Niall said, seeing some of the apprenticeship stuff and some of the people, you know, coming into it, you know, we, we it's how do we land that, land those principles so they can self-guide, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of a different way. I know Steve, you know, Steve Wade, you know, he's passionate about this as well. And, and I think, um, you know, there's some questions there that, that kind of like we need to kind of wrestle with, but like, you know, as a community, right, which is why one of, you know, your podcast is really good. We can start to have those discussions like as a group, do you know what I mean? Rather than our, in our individual mm. pockets, but it's, it's definitely difficult, a difficult thing to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you're right, and I think there's a there's a obviously a point with even with apprenticeship apprenticeship school they they seem to to be working apprenticeships are a really great way of of introducing project controls and it's almost like he was talking about a mindset and an attitude to problem solving uh, almost like the Elon Musk way ah I mentioned Elon Musk oh, uh, but first principles um, which you you kind of build up from first principles the physics way rather than you know just solving the problem solving from an outcome perspective and and we, we probably get stuck in in the process a bit too much. You know, like we've got to have a WBS, we've got to have a CBS, we've mm-hmm. got to have an OBS, and then the structures inhibit our ability to adapt or apply kind of new methods like new technology, uh, mm-hmm. which which we'll obviously get into in this pod, which would be exciting. Um, Hezron, did you have anything to add to that as well? Yeah, um, a couple of bits. I mean, it's it's one of my biggest bugbears to be honest with you. Project controls. Um, the you know you, you, you talk about cost controllers, cost managers cost engineers, you know, planners, schedulers, um, risk managers, risk analysts, they're, they're, it's, it's just the wild west, right? And it, coming from someone who has been involved in, you know, bringing people on board onto projects, you know, for, to build a team out and stuff like that, it's really quite difficult. And I think it's, it's difficult from both ends for those that are trying to find the right person and also someone trying to demonstrate the skill set they have um, on a CV or in an interview, right? It's a really difficult thing to do. Also, we're in a we're in an industry of, an, of opinions as well on some things. Um, I think fundamentally there's a there's a there's a one side and there's a, there's a red versus blue side in this. Like you know you talk about contractors and the mentality around project controls in the contractor world versus a client, and and they look at it from totally different ends. I think I think and this is more than project controls. To be perfectly honest with you, this is project delivery full stop. I think. Um, the adversarial nature of project delivery doesn't allow for things to move on in that sense. Um, and, and we as an industry need to sort of take a lead and, and, and press our foot to the gas on, on how we organize ourselves to do that. And as Simon mm-hmm. said, not just ticking a box or getting a badge for something. Um, I think there's good experience, there's bad experience. So, you know, ch- chartership is, is difficult in that sense as well, because it isn't, as, isn't binary like accounting or something like that in, in project controls. So um, it's something that I think the, the best minds in the industry really need to come together on um, and to sort of set a pathway. And I think we need a few major projects to sort of get on board with that, you know, real, real global leading projects to say, OK, let's, let's form a coalition, maybe a global standard for this. And then let's, um, you know, let's, let's go down that route. And obviously, as you, as you pointed out, Val, it can't be too rigid because it's an evolving industry as well. Projects are an evolving space with technology as mm-hmm. it is. So. I think we just need to get get the right the right minds together, and, and that's happening. You know, in certain places, that's happening. We just need to build upon that. Let it not be a closed club. To be perfectly honest with you, and um, and, and get as many you know new innovative innovative ideas in with what the um, you know the old rigid and and the fundamentals are telling us. So, so there's, a, there's a quote. Sorry, there's a there's a quote on this that yeah. always stood out for me from um, Steve Elliott. Um, I'm not sure Steve Elliott's. Uh, Project controls, um, very outspoken individual, and um, I, I remember this quote. He um, he said, "Project controls. There's more and more people that know more and more about less and less." And <laughs> what he was explaining is this this phenomenon of of this incredibly niche. Okay, I'm an oil and gas forensic schedule mm. analyst, and um, I've seen this. I, I've seen this a lot, and um, you know, I, I kind of think, well, hold on, hold on a minute. You know, my, the clients I'm working with, you know, 
they don't need that. They need they need somebody that understands controls, end to end controls, not somebody that dips a toe in for five minutes, um, does a a forensic piece of work work and then walks away. It, there is a place for forensic analysis, but that integrated approach where where you know a project controls manager understands the full kind of business case, benefits case, planning, estimate, planning, schedule, risk, reporting, governance, assurance, that's the right-hand person of the, the project director. And, and more and more, which is positive, sits sits along the C-suite, sits at the board level. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we'd like to promote. And um, it's really refreshing to rotate the roles. It's really refreshing to rotate between client, contractor, consultant, and it's really ref refreshing to to be involved in different phases of different jobs, or even to stay on jobs yeah. and, and see them through. Yeah, so yeah, yeah just to add to that as well, I think um, you know that that point you made around the niche, the niche uh, oil and gas forensic planner, right? That uses a certain tool as well, doesn't use anything else. Um, so many times I hear people saying, oh, "I've got this great uh, MEP planner," or "I've got this great you know nuclear planner," or whatever. And you know Dan Patson has, has been a been a guest on 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 podcasts, and you know he uh, you know would, would basis this consensus planning thing. I, I've never been the person that says, "Well, I'm just going to make a plan for the project as a planner, and then that's it." You know, how, who am I to tell the engineers or the designers on a project how to to build something, uh, or who am I to tell the construction manager and his team or her team to build something? Um, you know. Planning is not, the plan is, is, the planner is the custodian of the plan, um, but the owner of the activities are the people delivering themselves. And um, I don't, you know, people say, oh, you're a construction planner, you can just go away in a cupboard and build something and then bring it out and we'll put that for a tender or something. I think, I, I think it's absolute nonsense to be honest with you. I think the, it's a transferable skill across industry, um, so long as you've got the correct skills to in, engage the right people around the table to get buy into the plan, to, to own the activities, the durations, the risks associated with them. Uh, and that's how you come up with a plan that project can deliver and everyone's bought into. Yeah, that's the third, that's the third curve, right? Yeah, yeah that's the third curve. <laughs> <laughs> on, the nice. transferable, on the transferable <laughs> skills point, you know, we've been thinking for a while about, you know, like, you know, like diversity, cognitive diversity, different, you know, different perspectives. And I remember in the apprentice days, you know, I remember one of my apprentices, and, and these guys, you know, these were kids, right? You know, like basically straight out of school. So they're, they're not engineers. You know, they don't even kind of know. They, they, and to be honest with you, with apprentices, generally they're kind of like, like I just want an apprenticeship, right? And they, they pick one that they feel they might kind of get on with and they kind of, they're heading that path. So, so I don't think any of them said, oh, professional plan is what I was born to do. But they were bringing amazing insight, right? Because we were so ingrained into the old way of doing things. We just couldn't see what was right in front of our face. And so... You know, I think definitely seeing how do you get a broader perspective from the whole project team, people who aren't engineers, right? Every every kind of walk of life, because a lot of times, you know, if you're all mm. if you all get the same training, you'll think the same way. If we're all down here violently nodding at each other, then there's a big problem mm. somewhere, right? Mm. So, you know, as you said, welcoming in the team perspective and having someone go, look, I don't know anything about this, but isn't that wrong? And we're like, oh my god, you're right. You know, uh, is 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 really really critical. So you're right. It does need to broaden out and become more a language that everyone kind of understands and that feels comfortable pitching in at. And and I, I think we're we're actually a bit obsessed as well with the transferable industry mm. skills and looking outside of our our generally our major engineering type world into financial services, into pharma, into just into everywhere. And yeah. uh, you, you'll, you'll always learn something from those industries. And the real, the real positive observation we've had is those industries also could really benefit from some of the structure and some of the, some of the ways we work. And um, so it's, you know, we're very much not in a world now where we, we go into a, a company and we sit in a company for 40 years. Um, it's it's all about um, you know stepping outside the comfort zone and, and learning from those other industries and pushing the boundaries. And yeah. you know, in terms of in terms of the, the digital capability that we we currently are deploying on our major programs, I think we'd all agree the the capital spend versus the digital maturity isn't isn't quite where where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And but that we would also probably agree that's where the opportunity lies. 
Yeah, maybe just just a, a good example of the like different industry. You know, we, we speak to, you know, so pharmaceuticals. So you know, very topical at the moment, obviously. Kind of you know, like drug vaccine delivery. You know, and and the commercial relationship between the pharmaceutical clients and the clinical research organisations, right, and the CROs, and and you know, we've been talking around using NEC, kind of that collaborative risk management. You know what I mean? Mm. That, that early warning principle, right, of change. And and to them, you know, a lot of the, the the ways that they've been working together have kind of worked, you know, well over time. And they get, but there's a huge amount of opportunities of taking something that we known, you know, we know known NEC for ages, right? But that's new to that industry. And when we're talking to people, mm. they're, oh my god, you know, this would solve loads of problems, right? And so, you know, if you think about us. You know, let's take, for instance, you know, we're in construction and infrastructure, we kind of know that. But then you take the principles and like, if we really nail those principles, we might move the needle kind of five, 10% in our own space, right? But we might move it 40, 50% in other sectors that can really benefit and leverage some of the things that we take for granted. Yeah, that's bang on. I, I, I've actually experienced some of that as well, where there's been kind of new sectors that were completely kind of void of project controls now asking for a PMO setup or a project controls integrator. They're looking for digital transformation, uh, someone to roll out BIM for them, for example, then then there really isn't that many uh, operatives that can do that unless they've been transversed across various projects um, and they got that round experience. Uh, speaking from my own experience, I've, I've been about eight different industries. And for me, and I guess you guys are very similar, that that's actually been my, my, uh, my edge, I guess the edge to my sword is that I can go in and then be that guy that says, well, and Dale and I've had a few people that worked for us and said, well, you know, from our perspective, that doesn't look right, you know, because we're not mm. rail or we're not aviation or we're not, you know, nuclear yep. or whatever it might be. And that's, that's a great advantage point. Um, but for those, especially coming in fresh, um, I've had recently and last year, we had some, some grads working with us, uh, Metro tunnel and mm. they were fantastic. Yeah. You know, and I actually get to a point where we said, I don't know if you've experienced this as well. We had some data science guys, uh, data engineers, <laughs> I could teach them project controls faster. So mm. here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the interesting thing that, 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 I, that I said to some people that flipped it. If I have a data engineer, I can teach them PMO and project controls faster than I can teach a PMO or project controls guy, data science. So we're kind of at this precipice where um, the mode of the modality of thinking that these guys are coming out with is going to increase the speed and transactions in which we complete some of these transformations on projects, which is really exciting, as you can yeah. tell. Uh, I, I, this is this is new. So, so now you, you wouldn't go into a project and go, well, I'm going to be a 15-year planner. If I knew data science first, then I would use the same mental, I guess, applications and respirations, and you know, the systems that were taught, and I would apply that to the planning parameters. Um, yeah. if we, if we can switch gears now, and I'll let Dale get in for a breath, uh, around technology, cause technology is pretty cool. And we all like things to go faster, move better, be faster, cheaper, and, and, uh, more efficient. Uh, but we're not seeing that on major projects. Um, and clearly that's problematic. And so then as a project controls specialist, which is what we are, surely that responsibility sits with us to some degree. I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, what's your thoughts on the technological, um, let's call it a stall, if you like. It's, it's not as rapid as we thought it was, even though it could be. Um, and, and then take it from there. I'll probably start with, I'll start with Hezron this time. Yeah, sure. Um, very good point, to be honest with you. I think um, we, are, we are trying in certain areas. We're trying to adopt uh, technology. I think the way you got to look at it is, is, if there are, if there's a, there's, there are things, there's, there's opportunities or capabilities at your disposal that you're not taking advantage of, you've missed the opportunity to do the best you can, right? Now, not, I mean, even adopting 20 year old technology, we are slow to adopt in this industry, let alone what's just, just come out in the last six months, mm. in the last year. Um, it's getting better. And I think the, you know, the, 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 the technology companies, the big names in, in our industry that are, that lead the way on some of the tools that we use. I think the move to cloud um, and the, the SaaS solutions that allow for you know um, regular, frequent updates to being on the on the edge of their versions of their technology that they have is 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 a good thing. Um, and I think the more that organisations go down that, this this we're in, we're a traditional industry and the owning of something feels like is the way that it should be for a lot of people still. 
Whereas moving into a place where you don't necessarily own this piece of kit that you use, you know, you just use it. And then when they bring out something new, they take that one back and give you the latest version. Right. And I think, I think the way that, the way that those, those organizations are doing things needs to be adopted a bit more freely. I think we have legal challenges. We have commercial issues around contracts. Um, data security is a big issue, uh, which I don't really understand because the, the biggest, most secure organizations in the world use these tools, but this project we're working on, that's a public job here, can't, right? Because of data security, it's absolute, it's absolute nonsense. And people are just afraid to step outside of the lines that are painted around them. I think um, legal teams need to get a bit smarter on, on these projects. Commercial teams need to be a bit more open to what, what we buy, and what we use. I think also a few risks probably need to be taken. You know, we still go down, it's, it's a dominated industry on the tech side in terms of companies that, that deliver solutions to us. Some of them are great, don't get me wrong, but it would be good to see some of the small guys getting a shot um, at some of these things with tools that they innovate rather than them just, just being acquired by a big organization, you know? So um, which ones, think, mate? Which ones? One. Which ones? I'm allowed to say. Which ones? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Dan Patterson's a, a huge advocate of technology. Hey. And, uh, we're good, good friends of him in this, and, and and some of the stuff that he's helped to develop and, and brought to the the market has been adopted. And I think those are good, those are good uh, examples of that happening. Um, again, I think uh, the the things like Aconex, Conject Aconex being acquired by Argos is it, a good thing. It, lo it looks like a good move for that organisation and, and and a great tool, I think, for 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 the industry to be able to use. But there, there's a, I mean, I won't name names of ones that ha don't get adopted or they get mothballed because they're a competitor, but um, I think that does happen, uh, I, you know. So I think people need to move more to the SaaS environment. They need to to take advantage of of cloud uh, integration, by you know, massively. And and the, uh, you mentioned BIM as well earlier. Um, the, the the things that we can do with tech now, uh, in terms of the assessment or estimation of a project, the the you know, you got the usage of digital twin and and how we can sort of have this asset in the cloud. That we can we can run through iterations of of how how it go, it will behave in the real world, and and learn all these these um, lessons before we do things uh, in the real world, and and potentially cause an unsafe environment for people or degrade an assets uh, quicker than we need to. I think there it's just an endless world of opportunity, and I think we just we just need to get our you know butts into gear and, and and start start talking to the right people, start talking to the right organisations, and getting them involved, telling them our problem statements right, and saying. What can you guys do to solve this problem with with the, uh, the capability you've got? Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating, exciting space. Technology, um, particularly in controls, because this there's, there's still so much growth potential, right? Um, but I was listening with um, a lot of interest while Val was taking you through your paces there, and some of the things that came up was when Nal you were mentioning, you know, how we we know. What, what was it a lot a lot a lot about a little or something like that uh, more and more about less and more less. and more about less and less and you know we've previously spoken how controls is actually um a place where generalist succeeds in a specialist world um mm. because we do need to know a little bit about a lot rather than you know a lot about mm. something very small and so that that's quite fascinating but then val mentioned you know how you can train data scientists project controls easier than the other way around and then my comment was, well, do we hire incorrectly? Because there's this notion that controls has always been a, a data scientist, data analyst type role. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you didn't have that um, as a basis, then how could you be a successful project controller? Um, so yeah, just some observations. But then that got me thinking while you're talking about the whole technology space. Um, will tools replace then I guess some of the controls role, not not entirely, because we still need the human element to it. We still need experience, but we're hearing things like end plans, machine learning, etc., and some of the other technologies um, like Innate with Dan Patterson that's been created out there to assist with the controls role. Um, but then also, I'm thinking those listening at getting into controls and part of the the topic one is attracting people in. Um, where do we start? Because we we talk about controls being quite a technical one where you need to understand cost schedule etc all the structures and all of that but then there's also this um, leadership and behavioral side that you need as a as a really good decent project controls person too um, so 
I guess I'll go to you, Simon, as part of the apprenticeship side um, in trying to tackle that one because it's quite a meaty one. Um, do I start with technology? Do I start with um, more sort of leadership behavioral type things? How, how, how do I get into controls? And, and what's sexy about controls? Why would I get into it? Yeah, great, great question. I don't think any of us still know. I don't, I don't know a lot. <laughs> I kind of said, yeah, that's my career path and went on it. Most of us kind of fell into it. I think in, in my... You know, my experience, you know, as, as Nile said, you know, you've got cost schedule, you know, quality risk, all these other elements of it. Um, one of the key things that, that I think has, has really been transformational in the way that I, I approach things was the systems engineering. OK, right. So which was kind of like that basically making sense of a web of interconnectivity. OK, so that was that was really good. Understand the, the big picture. And then, as you mentioned before, kind of like behaviors, you know, leadership. So I, w I was lucky enough to be part of a behavioral transformation program. And I won't this isn't paying lip service. The term this was a real one and the most successful one of the most successful projects i was on was where the project team just really wanted to succeed right and so there was no you know that, that we kind of almost didn't need these massive hundred thousand activity schedules what we needed was some key deliverables that everyone was just rattled around and really wanted to do and then what they would do is they would adapt right so you throw adversity at them and they would change it would go well we can't use these processes we'll find new ways of of getting there but they really really wanted to do it and so you know it was about understanding the cause and effect of change right so people were able to work in their elements right so the, the big picture so you so i knew right that if there was a delay here or a problem here i knew where it would affect and then also how do i just get the team my boss used to call me the mascot <laughs> and she was like dr Anne hadry we still do we still do yeah yeah but, uh, <laughs> dr Anne hadry absolutely i'm just gonna move sorry yeah um and she used to call me the mascot and it was kind of one of those look come on you know we're going to do this right guys and everyone just really wanted to succeed and then you find that if everyone's all pulling in the same direction okay and you can get the right people to have the right conversations you don't necessarily need a lot of complexity kind of at the low level because people will just find a way um and, and so that I, I definitely say you know if you want to get in i think having a basic an understanding of the basics is really important okay but don't obsess over them i think a lot of what we do needs to be this so what answer. And, and if I think about the times where, you know, you talk about technology and the amount of investment, not just, you know, financially, but technologically, also the people change element that goes across, you know what I mean? All the kind of like cultural yeah. barriers you need to do in order to implement technology. And you very much find at the C-suite people saying they're saying, look, I've invested in all this stuff, right? And I ask when something's going to happen, you give me three different answers. Or you, you bring it in and someone says, no, that's wrong. And I can't I can't trust the information you've given me, yet you want me to invest all this money in new systems and, you know, and believe it. It's like, where's the value to me? And I think partly, you know, we need to take responsibility for the quality of our information, right, and for overcoming some of these problems. And we need to be delivering the answers, okay? Not necessarily constant awareness sessions and learning because we're all busy, right? And if you ever try and go, you know, you go to a chief exec and say, I'm going to teach you about planning. He's like, get out. You know, I, I don't have time for that. Just give me the answer. So I think it's a bit, bit of a catch-22. Um, you know, we want that. We want people to understand it. We want the right people getting into this. We want them to have those kind of core skills. But I definitely feel that for those of us that are in this business right now, we've got to step up. You know, we've got to say, look, don't worry about the how, right? Here it is, right? Here's the answer, okay? This is kind of what it can be. And then people are like, oh, right, okay, that does bring value. Let's talk about it. Let's you know, let's invest in it, right? Let's look at technology. How do we get this better? But at the moment, you know, I know you guys have definitely been in this, you know, you get a report, you go in, you've got this information and someone goes, nope, nope, nope. And then you're kind of back to the drawing board again, you know? So we, we you know, we've got to start taking more responsibility for the quality of insight and intelligence that we bring to projects. Can I, can I add a couple of, yeah. a couple of bits on there as well? Go ahead. Think, um, a few things that, so, um, I don't. I don't think uh, he's. Not he's not allowed to. Yeah, he's. <laughs> he's he, thinking about it. And he's having to think. <laughs> West London Wi-Fi isn't what it used to be. There we go. <laughs> In his rant. <laughs> yeah, the Wi-Fi said no. Here's Ron. Well, yeah. <laughs> you back with us? <laughs> I'm. I can hear. Oh, you dear. can hear us. Okay. Well, while that sorts itself out, I'll, I'll follow up with that. I think those are some really good points um, you raised there, Simon. And then that got me thinking. Well. Should we then, Niall, perhaps move to a model where controls is a bit like becoming a medical doctor where you have to study for X amount of years, cover all the bases, and then when you come out of it, you could then specialize or go into general practice. That might be perhaps one thought. But then we come back to what we discussed earlier in terms of how complex it is because 
different industries in different organizations even in the same industry have different names and titles and roles for the same similar type roles do we need to simplify it and what's the route is it through the apm do we need our own body perhaps of project controls separate to project management um there's just so much to go into what are your thoughts on that now i think it's a huge question <laughs> and um and i think um look my my gut reaction is that uh, i'm very nervous about turning it into the the phd doctoral sure. six to eight years type route um i think we need a uh, i think simon touched upon it earlier a bit more of a progressive approach to it um and you know in my experience the the best project controls people they they could quite comfortably sit in a project director role. They could be a, a project manager. Um, they are they're problem solvers, and mm. and you know in terms of in terms of what we look for in in people when we look for really good project controls professionals, uh, the place we always start is is the behaviours, the values, um, the, the actual softer side side of life. And uh, and then we get on to the, the the technical. So for me, it's it's more a mindset and an attitude and an approach. And I'm not sure how we codify that. We, I mean, we've we've spent a lot of time discussing this mm. and discussing putting in place models for for how we personally bring staff into the company, how we evaluate evaluate people in in, in a bit more of a um progressive manner than then you know what have you planned how do you do a wbs you know what's a p50 pat what's a cpi of 0.8 against a you know uh, an spi of 1.2 um because our experience tells us that, that if if you start with a person and the individual and the behaviors they they can they can get that and um and that, that's not to say that you know you can you can shortcut you know, the hard and fast experience of being on jobs and delivering jobs in, in multiple different, different um, scenarios. So it's a, it's a big question. One, one of our, our favorite um, kind of points of, of every year is going into uh, University College London with a previous colleague, Simon Adaman, who would be a great, great um, interview on here, by the way. Yeah. And um, we, you know, we all worked with Simon at TfL. He was a, a colleague. He he was instrumental in, in, in driving innovative contractor engagement. Uh, instrumental in setting up the, the kind of the bank station model. And he's now um, heading up a master's at University College London and is an associate mm. professor. Wow. And our, our role is to go in and spend a day with his students, uh, work through some theory. But then also quickly get into into the, the practical application of, of controls, and and try and open their eyes to to the, the potential of that. And um, you know these these kids are super smart. They they get it instantly, and and they they ask all the right questions. And um, so that's a, that's a very rewarding and exciting exciting um, thing that we wish we had had more time to do. But um, and, and, you know, we get a real buzz from, from doing that and, and also a real buzz from, from taking someone who's doing a different role, maybe in a different industry, and giving them a sales pitch to, to project controls and, and bringing them into the fold and, and getting them invo involved on, on, you know, some of these amazing programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a project out there for everyone, right? Regardless, regardless of your experience. I think one of the things, uh, and I was trying to say before I got cut off, but um, <laughs> it's that... Is that uh, everyone's done a project, right? Every whether you're in project management or project, everyone's done a project. Whether it be getting getting dressed in the morning or buy buying your prom dress or you know organizing for people to come round to 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 a get together or something like that. It's all a project. It's just organizing component parts of of something to make something happen, right? Whether it be a physical thing that's transpired at the end or a situation that's happened. It's all a project. And um, I think everyone's a candidate to come into project controls and everyone's a candidate to come into project management, regardless of your experience. 
I think Val, your point, I would probably agree with you that I think coming, you know, if you focused in on your um, ground capability when it comes to things like data science in, in IT, things like AI, dare I say it as well, I think those, those are great fundamentals, but you need to be able to communicate with people. You need to be able to converse with people in an open environment, mm -hmm. whether that being in a meeting virtually or not. You need to be able to relay your points without coming across in a way that is, is, is negative, you know, to, to try to benefit the project. So you, you've, I'd say focus on your behaviors, learn something that you enjoy that's gonna give you a good grounding for, for controls or project management or whatever industry. And, and you'll, be, you'll be more than welcome. Um, Dale, Dale, just picking up on your point around the replacement of human beings in, uh, in projects and, and Skynet and all this sort of business, right? Um, I, I, think, uh, if, I think you take the example of the Turing test, right? In, in modern robotics and, and, uh, and AI, you're never going to replace people in this. Um, you know, uh, the, the best cognitive brains that have been built uh, in the world are still not capable of doing what we can do on a multitask level, you know, and, and learning from our experience. Um, they may, may be much, much better at individual tasks. And when we talk about, say, planning as an example, the, the, the art of scheduling a project out could probably be done now by computers. Um, but making it relevant to the capability that you have at hand, the, the personalities involved, the logistical real world input into those delivery, into delivering that, that project, that is where you need people. So I think I'm all for more technology because what it does is it gives us more time to lift our heads up, look at the horizon, look at what's happening around us and, and make you know serious decisions and, and assess the, the circumstances for what they are and, and ultimately build better projects. No, those are very good points. And um, I'm sure Val's love to jump in and have a debate around how far, because he, he, he thinks he's a you know, mini Elon Musk and how far we can take no, technology. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no. well, well, that's at but least I, the, the line that I'll tow. Well, um, I, I hear he's uh, the richest man in the world now, old Elon Musk. <laughs> Do you hear that? Um, he's, he's not doing too no, no, I just, I was, What was interesting is, is I, I don't think uh, machines can't tell if someone's lying and you can't tell if a machine's lying. That's the difficult part. And so you're right, mm. machines can't. Uh, adjust for uh, behavioral cues. They won't pick up non-verbals as we would. Um, you know, they they probably have something more like an autistic spectrum, where they'll they'll be quite easy to computate certain, and they'll be able to multitask for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to do a planner's role because I've been saying that for about five years, haven't I, Dale? Um, <laughs> but they won't be able to present, you know, at a monthly review and gauge the director's feelings towards certain indicators you know maybe it's an spi cpi or the commercial tension in the room when the client's making mm -hmm. a certain gesture or a certain tonality they would never be able to pick that up in the way that we do we're so subtle with language um mm -hmm. actually a lot of the behavioral stuff that i i and I, you know, it's a big passion of mine as well i think the two things that if anyone's listening and they want to get into project controls really good project controls people almost function on a on a on a double hemisphere they they focus on people and they focus on data and then they're able to explain the two it's almost like you're able to to, to cross over and and that's a very unique skill set and so maybe that's why we sit in that sphere we can't really figure out why and we didn't really pick this vocation but just talking to you gents and and other guys in project controls we have this knack for flipping the switch if you like between mm going deep on analytical and whatever that subject matter might be and then pulling out and you know we can abstract it into something that mm. most layman's could understand hopefully hopefully if we do yeah, it well i think just just on that one uh, like one of the things that you know we see is you know so big data is a term right everyone talks about big data we've got all this data oh yeah but it's not intelligence mm. right it's just data and then you know I, I kind of find this fascinating subject around the role of ai and we're going to do machine learning and all these other things and kind of robots showing up at your door you know and then i just the amount of times i struggle with my google assistant to even understand what i'm saying oh no it's yeah. terrible isn't it and, and that's the reality yeah. right is that yeah uh, more yeah. wine yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we've run out of wine google alexa who is it <laughs> when you say it with a slur it doesn't understand uh, and, they, and they don't right or and, scottish and, and so I, I, I kind of begrudgingly struggle with like, you know, the latest in technology to try and get it to do some of the most simple things. Yeah. And I think that, 
you know, where the, the thing we need to recognize is there needs to be a significant commercial opportunity for these companies to invest in this mm-hmm. kind of romantic future that we kind of we talk about all the endless possibilities because at the end of the day, if there's no money in it, it's not it's just not it's not going to happen or it will happen, but just at a very slow pace. Right. And, and I think some of the things that we you know, that we see. You know, some of the opportunities, so let's take Primavera Cloud, okay, right? it's, it's a really good, you know, really good product set from kind of Oracle. And I think that rather than us going, let's go to the next next generation, a lot of times is let's just get our information together in something simple. So you heard the term hybrid yeah. cloud. So hybrid cloud is right, let's just try and mesh the new with the old, right? Let's kind of make the best of what we've got. And I think yeah. One of the first steps we've seen on some of our bigger jobs and bigger, you know, bigger roles has been just tell me what, what I know now, right? But in a way that I can understand. So whilst I'm absolutely with let's invest, let's do new innovative things. And we do need to make the kind of Nokia to iPhone generational leap. I, st- I also think there's, you know, we can't wait, you know, like a year or two years for tech to solve our problems. You know, but we've got to, you know, we've got to kind of leverage what we've got you know, get those kind of new, those new cloud SaaS based solutions, the integrated information, those robust things that kind of plug into what we already have, what, you know, what client organizations have, mm-hmm. make their information sing back to them and tell them the story that they need to hear, you know. Um, but yeah, I was just that, you know, I have this thing about, oh, robots are gonna be great and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna do this stuff and then I'm desperately trying to get Alexa to do something or give <laughs> like, you know, still can't pronounce my name right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. the Skynet thing is, is a couple of years away, I'm sure. Another another term that you, I'm sure you will have heard is the um, analysis paralysis. And um, Simon and I had a great mentor uh, in project control. It was a guy called Bill Edwards. Um, Bill's not here anymore, but we, we talk about him all the time. And we, we kind of know there's lots of living legacies of Bill Edwards out there. And I, I'll never forget when I, I actually left control. You know, my father was in controls and taught me P3 back in the day. And I did Jubilee line and stuff and then went into banking, finance, startups. And then I went back into TFL in, in the, the mid 2000s into a great team developing um, at the time, innovative control solutions. But I, I, I was kind of a little bit arrogant in those days. And I did all this whiz bang analysis and gave Bill Edwards these reports of all of these, you know, we were, we had the benefit of, you know, London Underground having 650 live projects, data flo- flooding in, and uh, lots of data that I could paint pretty graphs on. And I, I worked worked one weekend and produced all this 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 cool whiz bang stuff, and I gave it to him, and he he just said, okay, what does it mean? And I was like, look, I was like, look at my bubble chart, you know, look at, I've, I've done, you know, uh, I've done earned value at, at the portfolio level. I've gone down to project level, program level. This is, and he's like, yes. And it, he, he taught me this is analysis paralysis. You know, you can't put this on my, on my table and expect me to read this. Yeah. What's the, what's the one page on top that, that I need to care about? And, um, yeah. And I, I myself have fallen into this trap again and again. You have to take a step back and go, what does it mean? So what? You know, we're spending all of this money, time, investment. What does it mean? How's it going to change change the outcome of a project program? How's it going to, going to add value? And um, so, yeah, now and then we need to take a deep breath, use our brains and think, right, what, you know, what's what's the golden nugget in this reams of, of information? Yeah, I got another good, good example of that one. Sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. And it's, it's quick. So I got given this giant like report, massive, right? And so this very senior person said, tell me what that means. You've got two minutes. So of course I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> now, and, I, and I look through and I get like four pages in, I stop, I put it down. So now I've got time to get myself water and et cetera. And he comes back in, he said, right, what do you think? I said, how many of these jobs, this is a seven year job. How many of these would you done before? He has never done it before. I said, why are they saying that you're going to be 25 days late, seven years from now? Right, because it was, this is the data, right? these are the numbers, and we run the critical uh, part. Yeah. This is push this, and this is push that. So there you go, that must be what it means, right? But it was kind of like, look, it's not as straightforward as kind of the modeling side, as, as Niall said. You know, it's like, so what, right? All this information, but what do I do? And you, and you know, you guys, you know, in project management are always kind of like, what are the three phone calls I need to make today? Please tell me, tell me, mm-hmm. right? That's, what, that's what's value. So if I say, look, mm-hmm. We've got everything else covered, but you need to go and find these three people, right? That's that's the type of intelligence that we need to bring, not the, yeah. oh, by the way, here's like 20 different statistical models of how this might fail, do you know what I mean, in various scenarios yeah. over the next few years. I, I, I think there's, um, there's if we ask the question, how would we teach a computer to 
uh, to learn project controls, right? Or project management or whatever. Um, a, a computer would go about learning it, right? The way that humans don't want to in, in this modern society. It would fail very fast, very quickly, many, many times and learn very quickly. We are afraid of failure, right? The way that social media is now, the way the world is, politicians cannot say something without getting chastised regardless, right? People are afraid to fail because they feel as if it's going to inhibit their reputation and their capability to move forward and progress in their life, right? Projects uh, and project controls, project management, anyone who works, you know, you need to, you need to just forget about perfection, forget about the perfect plan, forget about the perfect, the cost model. It doesn't exist, right? The only, what, the only time it exists is after you've finished and it's an as-built. Yeah, that's it, because that's how we built it. Now, people are afraid to, to put their neck on the line and say, you know, sit in a meeting or, or whatever and, and, and say, no, I disagree with that and I think we need to do this. Or you, you, just, you shouldn't be afraid. And we need, to, we need to nurture an environment that allows for people to do that safely mm. and gives them the platform to do that. Um, and that, that, that goes beyond project controls, you know, project directors, the, you know, the leadership from top to bottom needs to, needs to portray that to the, the team, you know, to give them that safe space. And, and that's where you're going to get innovative, innovative ideas. You're going to get, you know, um, people thinking outside of the box on things, but also you're going to learn quickly. And in the next job will be that little bit easier, albeit it might be more complex. So it'll probably be the same again, picking up on Val's point, you know. We, we sort of fail at the same rate as we always have done, but we just build things a bit more complicated now. Yeah, and we were talking earlier about this, the concept of the watermelon culture, right? Green on the outside and red on the inside. And, you know, if I'm thinking about a project, the idea of controls is to set up some indicators to know where you're not where you thought you would be, right? And every plan is a guess, okay? And guess what? You know, it's very difficult to get those things right, as Hez said. So if someone, if you've got a project manager who comes in and says, here's my metrics, these are red. Okay, and this is what I'm doing about it, and this is kind of where I feel it's going to go. That's what that's called project management, right? That's great. That's where you go around and say, "Congratulations, you've set yourself up for success. You can spot where things are going wrong. Congrats, and I'm going to stand you up in front of everyone, right? As opposed to, why is that red? I'm going to kill you for that, right? And and it's kind of one of those things where you know senior management, right? Senior management need to you know understand that you said like, you know, we're going to get this wrong, okay? You know, it's not going to go perfectly. And if someone's bringing their problems to you because they've identified them, okay, that's great. Okay, that's, and that should be rewarded. So we've kind of got, a, I, I used to have this thing back in the, back in the old days and now, yeah, I used to have like, um, red is good because S asterisk asterisk T happens, right? And it was because, you know, we all needed to know that as long as it's set up right and as long as you're doing something about it, you know, that fear of, you know, you should be able to fail, but in that controlled way where you know the direction you should be going. It's really important that people feel, as, as Hezron said, that there's an environment where they feel safe to talk about the challenges and to say, look, this isn't going according to plan. It should be about how do we fix that, right? How do we get there? Not yeah. don't bring that stuff to me ever again, you know, which, which is, and I think if we're all going to be honest with ourselves, that's kind of everywhere. So a bit of a topical subject, right? So, so COVID-19, yeah, um, vaccines and all that sort of stuff. Vaccines usually work by giving someone a little bit of what the bad thing is that they're going to receive, so that they can build up some experience about how to fight it, right? Exactly the same thing. Like people just, you know, there's no silver bullet to this stuff. You just kind of need to weed your way in a little bit, start learning the lessons, the pain, getting the pain early on so that you... And the, our brains work in a very special way, you know, that we, we just sort of avoid all the things that cause us pain and strife throughout our lives. And we get really good at avoiding those things. So when we learn to walk, right, it's like, oh, I keep falling over, I keep hurting myself. What do I need to do to stay upright? Um, and, and we just need to apply that, you know, liberally to our projects. And, uh, and, and I think we'll all be in a better place. Yeah, and I think, um, um, you know, talking about previous experiences, and, and we will have all experienced, you know, the polar extremes of, of these cultures and environments and you know I will um, I will call out Tideway and um, I remember landing very early on in Tideway and you know pre pre-consent pre-contract award um, and it had the benefit of of the team that delivered London 2012 CLM team and you know day two you know I remember sitting with the entire leadership team walking through the critical path and um, and I also remember people like Andy Mitchell, Andy Alder arriving, who, fun enough, came, come from a controls background. You know, have 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 done planning. Particularly, Andy Mitchell was a planner back in the day. And um, 
from day one, that it was in a DNA, you know, this big program management and program controls combined with the culture of, of you know, talk about the challenging tasks, talk about, talk about where the real issues are, um, produce reports that, that, that make sense and, and drive action. And, um, you know, getting that in from, from the early phase, even, you know, pre-contract phase, and leveraging that that kind of discipline to get things like consent, go through uh, regulatory reviews, it just becomes you you know part of the DNA and part of the the, the drumbeat of daily life on a job. Um, but you know you can't underestimate the the um, you know the value in that leadership that, that drives that culture and drives kind of that type of behaviour. And where it gets always interesting is you know there's challenges on jobs and, and there's commercial challenges on jobs. And, um, you know, we probably have also seen the case where you have the big project kickoff and, you know, you go paintballing and et cetera, et cetera. And then six months downstream, you haven't had a program accepted. There's a big hairy compensation event and, and, you know, the paintball bullets are now bullets. Well, you know, you need to, uh, you, you need to avoid, avoid that. And, um, so, you know, I know you've had Glenn Hyde on a podcast and, and that absolute focus on collaboration and spirit of mutual trust and cooperation and living, breathing, walk, you know, demonstrating that, um, that's where the win is. And it is hard, but it's, uh, but the dividends are, are undeniable. Yeah, they're, they're brilliant comments. And I think we all agree that there's a there's an element of what we do um and i'm going to say we're, we're kind of like the the project psychologist so you, you need to be a a fairly well um uh, persistent and perceptive person to pick up on on people dynamics and, and team dynamics and how that affects things you know optimistic bias and group think are probably two of the unspoken evils of project control, or even projects in general, project delivery in general. And one of the things we always go into bat for is is to be that critical friend to the C-suite to uh, drive teams to work together across boundaries and departments to integrate and find common levels of, you know, you, you try and find common levels of agreement, get the engineering team to talk to the, the test team and get the installation team to be, handing over documents that are worthy. You know, this, these are things that we probably aren't originally within our remit, but we, we end up downstairs talking to these guys and trying to get them to work together. And that's because, you know, we, we think strategically and it's, it's great to hear um, at least it's almost like an echo chamber with you guys here that, you know, mm -hmm. what you're talking about, we, we kind of all synergize with, and it's really great to have your feedback. So, so thanks for that. Now I'll over to you, mate. Yeah, no, it's fascinating listening and, my goodness, an hour's gone quickly. There was so much more we can talk about. Yeah. And perhaps we get you back for a take two, um, gentlemen. Sure. But just just listening back um, on your point around um, students, we actually, I don't want to give too much away about the season because there's ex some exciting stuff coming up. But we actually have um, a pod lined up where we're getting a few students um, cool. in to get their perspective. Um to to share you know what what they see from from their their vantage point um and you know we've we've all heard of this you know previously perhaps this reverse mentoring getting the view of those perhaps less experienced than yourself and and that'll be a great view i think to get so that that we can change and react in, in a more positive way um but i do love that you all shared stories personal stories of what's happened in your careers because that really resonates with people listening to this as well to go oh shit i can fuck up it's okay you know, um, <laughs> so that's great. And then the final thing I actually took from this pod is you got to either be a mascot to be really good at project controls, or you got to be like a vaccine. So if you're one of those two things, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, gentlemen, thank you so much um, for being on the podcast today. Um, I'm just going to come to each one of you for a final thought or remark. You want to leave the listeners with this start with you, Simon? Um. Yeah, I guess, you know, um, help, help each other. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't try and do this stuff, stuff, stuff yourself, do you know, like, um, um, and if, and we're given the regard uh, to project controls, just uh, don't, you know, like work, understand this is, is the people side, you know, don't, as has said, don't be afraid of failure and kind of work with, work with people um, is, you know, it's probably a good, good thing to leave with. 
brilliant wise words here's did you want to add to that yeah i mean um the way i see that, that i sometimes summarize project controls is the conscience of a project right um and and your know, conscience is the little niggling niggling voice in the back of your head so that voice needs to be heard um you need you need to make it heard whichever way you can or you need to start telling different people if the ones that you're telling it to aren't listening so just just have the courage to stand up and and, and say when you see something that doesn't look or feel right um it might feel like a struggle or, or a risk you're taking but your projects and and the, pe the the real the good people around you will thank you for it and it will do you'll pay you dividends as, as Ed Nas said um and and you'll start succeeding hopefully on projects brilliant brilliant Niall final wise words from yourself um yeah just as, as a wrap um uh, you know I just to promote controls project controls you know what what other career can you go around the world um you know modernizing cities upgrading Victorian infrastructure, um, meaning so many, you know, brilliant people along the way. So uh, as, as a group who have who've had different careers in, in different sectors, um, you know, we're, we're very privileged to work in, in the sector we do. And um, yeah, give it a go, be proud of it, be courageous and brave, and, um, and you'll have a wonderful career. I couldn't echo those sentiments any more. Val, final thoughts from yourself? No, I think that's it. I think I, I just wanted to probably remind people that when I said I can teach data scientists PMO quicker than I can teach PMO data science, uh, I meant it. Uh, but I, I do, <laughs> I do still believe. I, I do still believe that 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 there's hope for all of us. So if you need to anything to search, look at data ops. Uh, probably learn a bit of blockchain. Learn a bit about BIM and digital engineering, systems engineering. Um, uh, there's some free tools out there. It literally is, there is no barrier to this information. Uh, so, so educate yourselves. Yeah. Brilliant. I agree, Val. There is so much opportunity in this space. So take advantage of it. Gentlemen, just before we go, we've got a quick pop quiz called Tenor, which is 10 questions and 10 answers, <laughs> uh, within 10 minutes, hopefully shorter than that. And if you're up for that, we can take you through it. We'd love to hear from you. Let's do it. A thumbs up from everyone. Okay, great. So sure. we're not we're not going to go one at a time. We'll I'll ask the question, um, and we'll just go Nile, here's Ron, Simon in that order, and we'll go through Rapid. it. So it's a pop pop quiz. So first Rapid question. Pop quiz. Yeah. <laughs> so first question. What is your morning routine? Um. <laughs> shower, shave, never. Big breakfast, hit the road before the kids get up. Great. Here's? Uh, yeah, it's similar. It's just shower. Um, I usually check emails before I do that, to be honest with you. Oh, here uh, we go. <laughs> yeah, get dressed, get some music on my ears. Um, and if I can, I'll try to get a run or something in. One-handed nice. press-ups from his. <laughs> <laughs> Simon? Yeah, I wake up, work out where I am, bump into things. Brush my <laughs> yeah, on my bike to wake up. Lovely. Sounds like a bit of exercise for each of you, whether it's going to the shower or doing one-headed push-ups. Question number two, how do you usually plan out your day? And we'll go in the same order. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not as good at this as I should be. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite variable, but uh, I have a bit of a routine on the, on the journey in. Um, I should write more to-do lists, but um, I just prepare myself mentally for the day and I, I try and pick one thing out that I'm really going to get done. Yes, yeah, so I, I have a perpetual list. Um, so I usually <laughs> rewrite the list every day, depending on what I got uh, achieved the day before in order of their importance, right? So you can only sort of get one, two or three things, important things done in a day. Maybe if there's some smaller stuff that you can sort of knock out the park, you know, half a dozen of them. But yeah, it's like a perpetual list, really. And it's like I rewrite which ones that must get done today on to the top. Uh, I'm, I um, probably got some good advice from someone. It's kind of like don't ever try and plan further than four weeks out. In you know, definitely kind of now we're, we're you know like COVID and, and remote working. But um, I got some things that kind of are always in my head that kind of know that we're doing and that we're working for that kind of just always just just stay there. And then some of it is like who shouts loudest and, and then other things is uh, 
you know, just making sure that there's time during the day for me to actually step away from the Zoom calls and, you know, mm. not not stare at a screen all the time. So I think that's that's important. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Question three: How do you deal with stress? I go fishing. Nice. Yeah. So my wife's a psychologist, and every now and again, she sits me down and says, "Niall, could you go fishing?" <laughs> and uh, and I know I know what that means now. And <laughs> I, I go fishing, and I come back a new man. Whether I right. catch anything isn't that important. Well, I, I love fishing too, and the best thing is, if fishing was about catching, it would be called catching. Exactly. <laughs> so, no, that's great. Here's. Um, yeah, for me, uh, it's exercise, I suppose. So whether it be a road cycling or running, or I used to play football, but I get a bit old now, you know, so. Um, but that really helps for me, like the sort of monotonous, you know, the, the, the drumbeat of running or cycling that, and, and the exercise really helps to clear my mind. Think about things without the anxiety and stress and fear with them. Um, so then I actually feel like I can attack them uh, and, and, and overcome the obstacles. I think, um, yeah, I was cycling great. I have started using the meditation app. So I, I use Calm. I know there's a few of them. And, and that's really my happy space is um, I'm, I'm big into cooking is I cook in the kitchen and I watch The Simpsons at the same time. It's on Disney. And it's impossible for me to think of anything else whilst I'm cooking and watching Simpsons. So I'd say that if you say like, where would I, where do I always want to be? Right. It's cooking in the kitchen, watching The Simpsons. And that, that really helps me uh, get all the other stuff out of my head and, and really relax and, and de-stress. Brilliant. With we a should glass get you... of wine, maybe. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Jan. <laughs> <laughs> we should get you back on the pod on your favorite recipes, perhaps, in the future. <laughs> I have a lot of them, so definitely. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> right, question four. Let's get to it, gents. What is your favorite book, audio, or movie? I So my, my favorite film is Goodfellas. Um, I, I must too. have watched it triple triple figure times and uh, I never get bored of watching it. And I also watch it with, you know, there's like a, a Goodfellas club and every now and again, get together with old mates, watch it, chop the garlic with, with the razor blade and cook the pasta and drink the wine and just chill out for, a, for an hour and a half. So it's a very transient answer for me. Um, I couldn't say one, but, but I, I recently got a new uh, television, right? And the first film that I watched on it was Ready Player One, right? Because I just, I really love the film. I really love the topic. I love the pop culture. I love the notion of this uh, this virtual world that people can go and just be whatever they want to be in, right? But also it's a great looking film and the cast is great, but the book's also all brilliant as well. So um, yeah, Ready Player One, I'd say, no. Can I go, I can nail all three. Um, so Groundhog Day is the movie and I definitely cry every time I watch that. My favorite book is Name of the Wind by Patrick office which is a brilliant brilliant first book and my favorite song circles by adam f from the uh, colors album so absolutely no problem with that one my favorite food is pizza by the way as well pizza. So, yeah so oh wow I commit to, i can commit to a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome question five who is your hero and why um so mine's my father and uh just he was just an incredible human being um, taught me pretty much a lot of what I know and uh, I'm very lucky my hero was my father brilliant I might cry now as well <laughs> uh, for me Michael Jordan um, oh. I absolutely adore Michael Jordan growing up I, that recent Netflix documentary right more than the game unbelievable but I always that basketball wasn't as popular when I was growing up in the, in the UK right but I just, I absolutely loved it. I loved his drive, his determination. He, you know, he wasn't the biggest guy, wasn't the fastest guy, but he did whatever he could do to win. That that un, unrelenting, you know, and Simon is probably going to laugh at me now because I'm, I'm super competitive, right? But that's probably where it comes from. Um, it, you know, just, just, uh, just, it, but also a gentleman as well. So um, really good values, but yeah, Mark Jordan. Yeah, I'll have to go cliche, I suppose, my, my, my dad as well, and that's, just because I had some a lot of issues when I was kind of growing up and, and my dad took me aside and just said that, you know, to kind of I could still do it and he believed in me and all those other bits and pieces. And I feel that my life would have gone in a very different direction if we hadn't had that conversation and if I hadn't had that, had someone else to believe in me. So yeah, he's uh, he's probably the guy for me. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. So question six, what is your favorite sound? 
Mm, good one. So, so for me, it's again, it's it's a nature nature thing. It's I love early mornings. I love the tranquility of of an early morning and uh, being sat on a riverbank with mist coming up, nature around. Um, that's my happy space. I'm going to cheat, and it's two, uh, uh, and there's both. So it's either hitting a perfect golf shot, right? <laughs> or when you smash a 30-yard football into the top bin and you just hear it ruffle through the net. Perfect. <laughs> <I'll be sad. laughs> my one is genuinely, when, when my kids are laughing hysterically, you know, not just thinking they have to laugh because I made a crap joke, um, but when they're <laughs> laughing, just hearing my children laugh, just like, it's just the best, man. That's like, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. <laughs> not little anymore, but you know, that's, that's a brilliant sound. Brilliant. Question seven. What is the biggest mistake you've made on a project? Hmm. Let's flick the order up, shall we? Let's, uh, Hezron. <laughs> Straight, let's start with Hezron. Come on, come on, let's do this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't pinpoint it to, to one specific thing, but I think there have been a couple of occasions where I didn't, I didn't speak up and I didn't say what, what should have been said at the time. Um, for one of many reasons at the time, it was all personal, whether it be, you know, I felt like maybe I was having someone else under the bus or any of that, that sort of stuff, or, or I wasn't, I was afraid to say what, I, what I, I wanted to or should have done. So there have been a couple of occasions where if I could go back, I would have said, been more vocal and said, actually, guys, you need to, we need to stop this and we need to take a, another look. Who's next? Simon, go. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose it's kind of like that. My most memorable mistake. I'm not going to say biggest because you know I, I too feel there's been times you know like where things would be different if you made a different decision. But my most memorable one, right, and it's back to the fear of failure, is I had this um, analysis paralysis, this big report, and it was going through to this American director, and he's like really hardcore, really detailed. And I sent it in, and um, it was wrong, right? And they said, "Oh, you know, is this right? Is this right?" I looked at, it, "Oh no, no." And of course, I checked that mistake, but I didn't. I didn't check another mistake, right? I sent that thing in like six times and every, and every time it's come back, it like, what about that? What about that? And I was so nervous, right? I was, so, I was freaking out. Every time it came in, I was just going, oh my good God, I've, this has got to be right. This has got to be right. My brain went to mush. I couldn't think. And I just kept on sending it in. And in the end, it just came in. He was just like, it's like relax. You just got to relax. You got to relax. Just sit down kind of go through it. And I just remember thinking, I'm never going to do that again. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's just, that was really mm. far by fire to have someone of that come into you and say, Simon, you keep messing this up. You know, you got to, mm what's going on and it was because i was just you know yeah the pressure and loads of different things but i was just absolutely going mad and freaking out so yeah that that's really sticks in my head you know like number one obviously check your work but also just take a breath take time you know get yeah. right that's probably the most memorable one that was a long long time ago by the way not like, you know. it was last week <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah i'll go for, i'll go for a, a slight comedy one as well so Prior to rejoining Project World, I worked for a startup that did anti-money laundering and fraud software in retail banks. And um, it, it all started to go wrong where I got the, got the job on the basis that I speak French. I was then fired out to Paris to present a, a new product to a French board that I translated on the train. And um, I, I was presenting the product and I was reading the room and the faces were getting redder and redder and redder. And my, my translation, shall we say, wasn't, wasn't quite what it should have been. And I what had to, it? It, it was very technical language, you know, it, I, I, call, I call it franglais. <laughs> and, um, and I had to just, I had to fess up and, and just say, look, you know, this is the first French client. We're going to um, get this professionally done. Please bear with us. Uh, sure enough, we went back and had it professionally done, and uh, it was a slightly, slightly easier meeting. Nice, nice. That's brilliant. spectacular fail. <laughs> Those are the ones we usually learn the most from, so that's great. Question mm. eight: What would you tell your ten-year-old self? Well, now, it's, what would I tell my ten-year-old self? Wow, um, I would. Yeah, I would say to my 10 year old self, you know, the important things in life are friends, family and fun. And, mm. uh, and focus on that and focus on, on living the right way. And the rest would fall into place. 
I would tell my 10 year old self to not worry about growing up and be a kid for as long as possible. <laughs> Good. I'd say you'll never be great at something you don't love. And so, you know, mm. find something that you're kind of really passionate about and go for that. Don't, don't accept for, for anything else. Oh, those are great, great points. Number nine, what profession other than your own would you like to have attempted? So, so in my, in my years growing up, I was convinced that I was going to be the next George Best and play for Man United and be a, a rock and roll footballer until I grew to be six foot four and then played a little bit more like, like Peter yeah, Crouch, <laughs> a, a bad Peter Crouch. So um, there you go. Um, so Simon calls me the, uh, <laughs> Simon calls me a baby giraffe. <laughs> so you, you could probably imagine the scenes on a football pitch, right? I would, uh, I always wanted to be a pilot when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, I, yeah, so I would definitely be a uh, pilot, probably a fighter pilot. Nice. Well, yeah, m mine's definitely restaurant, work in a restaurant. Um, I, I did some of that like a long, long time ago. And um, yeah, I, I love it. You know, they're kind of like, you know, you, you know, putting something out, you know, it works or it doesn't work. Really, really good. Very short, iterative space of whether you kind of did something good or not. And I just love that buzz, you know, working with, working with customers, etc. So I'll... Instant gratification, eh, Si? Huh? Instant gratification. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was it was a choice, right? It was kind of computers or engineering or whatever or, or, or kind of restaurants. And I don't regret my decision at all, but I definitely, there's another parallel universe where I'm, I'm you know, freaking out, burnt hands, all that. <laughs> in the kitchen. Simon, Simon has six, six barbecues, a smoker, <laughs> and a pizza oven in his garden. So you, you need to come wow. and sample this, guys. Yeah, you guys need to come. Brilliant. We'll uh, come post it from the air. We'll Done. host it from the when you're over, no problem. Yeah, we'll wait for Thanks the invites. Time. Final question, question number 10. If you had to spend £1 million in a day, what would you spend it on? Starting with Simon. <laughs> um... This is hard. This is hard. I don't know. I kind of like say say your wife. No, no. I think <laughs> I, I think it would need to be something stupid, like filling a swimming pool with Big Macs or something like that. <laughs> you, you know, something ridiculous. Like how many peanut M and M's could I get into a thing if I spent a million pound on peanut M and M's? How big would that actually be? Because if you've only got it for a day, you know, you might as well um, do something crazy with it, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. That is a very difficult question. So yeah, I'm gonna, I gave you the stupid answer. There you go. <laughs> Is wrong. Uh, what would I do with a million quid? I would. Um, that's a really difficult question, you know. I would. I would just sort of buy a holiday for everyone that I know, and that would just go away. Like I'd just yeah, big holiday, massive holiday on a private island or something, and just kind of, especially in this COVID times, man, we're really missing the social element of life. Like just uh, yeah, fly us all to like Richard Branson's island or something, and just uh, have a great week or something. My, mine's probably going to be hedonistic as well, actually. And uh, I would, I would just get as many friends, family, colleagues, uh, ra rascals together, and just just have a, just have a, a very good day together. Yeah. And and every everybody's desperate. And do mine. <laughs> and, I mean, and you know, it's, we haven't really touched on on COVID and the, the world we're living in, and and just that desperate need to reconnect with human beings and yeah. hang out with yeah. hang out with the ones we love um we're, we're craving that we're desperate for that yeah agreed no there's a thank you so much for going through that it's it's it's, it's great to um get a bit of insight into your lives and you know share share with those out there and have a bit of fun with it as well so appreciate it. and thank you all for your time today too so folks, that's all we have time for in this episode, but it doesn't have to stop here. Support our charities and access blogs at projectchatterpodcast.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel and your podcast player so you don't miss the next one. A massive thanks to Simon, Niall and Hezron for joining us today. Thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now. <laughs>